I've been reading a lot of the comments in our previous deep dive videos, and it seems like you guys listen to lore right before you're about to go to bed. So I thought it would be an excellent idea to tell you guys the story of the origin of the Traitor Primarch, so the most soothing voice that I can, because apparently the Grimdark universe is perfect to go to sleep to. Let's start off with one of my favorite Primarchs, and one that everybody dislikes, Lorgar. When Lorgar Aurelian was taken from the Gene Laboratories on Terra due to the schemes of the Chaos God, his gestation capsule landed on the feudal world of Kokas. The world of Kokas was one of the first worlds settled in mankind's exploration of the stars. Located to the galactic northwest of Terra, within the region of space, later known as the Segmentum Pacificus, Kokas continental masses were dotted with strange, crumbling edifices, and no amount of exploration and research could fathom their purpose. At three times the size of Terra, with a fraction of the population, it took almost five standard years to turn once around its merciless sun, and it turned with great patience. A day lasted a Terran week, a week lasted a Terran month. From orbit, its skin was a landscape of unforgiving mountain ranges and desert plains, veined by threading rivers. It was in dry lands like these that the humanity's ancestors, the very first men and women on the world no longer called Earth, rose in lands that would become known as the cradle of their civilization. Imperial scholars and historians believe that the world of Kokos was once highly advanced technologically during the Dark Age of Technology, much like the rest of the human settled space, but fell into anarchy during the turbulent time known as the Age of Strife. Few records remain of Caucasian society that rose from the ashes of the Age of Strife. The few descriptions that do exist speak of a caste of priests calling themselves the Covenant who rebuilt the shattered society of Colchis on the promise that a great leader would one day come to deliver them from the darkness their world had descended into. With harsh religious observance, the Covenant's strict dogma became a gigantic, monolithic belief structure that permeated every facade of daily life on Colchis. Colchis was a world of peace and law, and the people of the capital city of Varadash, also known as the City of Grey Flowers, respected its holy leaders above all. Over the generations, civilization had spread itself thin across the arid continent of Colchis, with most of its city-states clinging to the coasts. On a world where roads across the desert plains would be little more than foolish, each city-state maintained links to the others through sky trade and ocean freights. Colchis became a world of old gods. It was said that religion was in the air, in the touch of the sun, in the taste of the dust. To its people, worship of the higher powers was as much a part of them as the beating of their heart and the crying of their children. Bound in feudal traditions, Colchis had once been a world of high technology, but those days lay forgotten in the old night. When the infant Lorgar fell from the sky, he landed on a planet held in the hands of the ruling Covenant. A nomadic tribe of desert outcasts, known as the Declined, under the chieftain Fan Morgal, found the infant's shattered capsule and took him in. They named the child Lorgar, or the Rain Caller, in the Caucasian tongue. Seventeen local days later, Lorgar, already grown to the size of a young child, was discovered by Corferon, an exiled priest of the Covenant and his caravan of exiles. Corferon had been kicked out of the Caucasian capital of Varadash for advocating that the Covenant be more forceful and aggressive in its conversion tactics. The predominant religion on Colchis was that of the Covenant, later known as the Old Faith or the Old Ways. It was a polytheistic religion dedicated to the worship of the four entities that were in fact the Chaos Gods in their more benevolent guise. Immediately sensing greatness in the boy, and believing him blessed by the Caucasian gods he called the Powers. Corferon convinced Lorgar to become his disciple, and promptly killed Fan Morgal and the Decline to cover up the boy's identity. Despite enduring Corferon's vicious, emotional, and physical abuses, Lorgar became a zealot believer in the faith of the Covenant, and researched every aspect of its theology that he could find. He came to believe that there was a single god he named the One, that led and bound together in his being the polytheistic pantheon of the Covenant, which comprised of the four lesser gods. 
Corferon dismissed such notions initially as heresy, and often abused Lorgar in an attempt to shape the young Primarch's personality and create an emotional dependency upon him. At the same time, Corferon saw something special in Lorgar and attempted to manipulate him in order to use the boy's obvious extraordinary talents to take over the Covenant and the rule over Calchas. Nonetheless, despite the abuse, Lorgar remained intensely loyal to Corferon and even saved his life during a mutiny by the caravan's crew after they were asked to beat Lorgar once more by his foster father for some minor transgression. Lorgar also grew close to others in Corferon's caravan, which included the mercenary captain, Nagzata, and the enslaved covenant teacher, Nairo. Despite Corferon's abuse, Lorgar quickly surpassed his master. He became a devout teacher, his skill in oratory, and the power of his superhuman charisma winning him many followers, allowing him to rise to the position of Archpriest of the Godsworn as the followers of Lorgar's branch of the covenant and the believers in the one. After saving Corferon's life in the mutiny, the priest ended his physical abuse of the Primarch and began to show him some affection. He named Lorgar the new bearer of words, and Lorgar's fame spread rapidly thereafter, as he began liberating slaves held across Colchis. He slowly amassed a great army of the Godsworn that marched on the Caucasian capital of Varadash. After a fiery sermon before the city gates, they opened to him. The lower priest of the covenant within the capital presented the corpses of the ruling covenant ecclesiarch and the hierarchs as a gift to the city's new conqueror. After taking Veradash, Lorgar's god-sworn forces moved city to city, taking them either peacefully through conversion, or in some cases, putting all within to the sword for their heresy in refusing the faith of the one. After several Terran years of fighting, the last city to stand against Lorgar's army was Garavella, which was protected by an artifact dating back to the Dark Age of Technology known as the Storm Generator, which was capable of unleashing a raging storm front in its area of effect. In what appeared to be a miracle, Lorgar approached the raging maelstrom across the city and parted the storm, allowing his army to swarm through the gap and capture the city. With the fall of Garavella, Lorgar found himself the master of Colchis, and he immediately named Corferon as the High Priest of the Covenant, but without pause. Lorgar proclaimed to the faithful that they still had much work to do. Unfortunately, as Lorgar grew in standing amongst the people as their religious leader, the other members of the Covenant's ecclesiarchy began to grow jealous of its popularity. Lorgar's youth had been constantly plagued by visions of a mighty warrior in gleaming bronze armor coming to Colchis, a one-eyed giant in blue robes standing beside him. At one point, the visions reached such an intensity that Lorgar claimed that the prophesied return of Colchis's one true god was soon to occur. He began to preach his news to the people of Colchis, causing disruptions to the theocratic rule of the covenant as the people converted to this dissident belief in the one god. Lorgar's enemies in the covenant saw this as an opportunity that they had been waiting for to remove the threat that Lorgar presented to the status quo declaring him a heretic to the old ways. Those of the Covenant who came forward to arrest Lorgar were killed by his followers. The Covenant then split into two factions, the followers of the Old Faith and the Godsworn, the Brotherhood of Lorgar, who continued to believe in the One God. And a holy war of immense proportion erupted, eventually forcing the entire population of the world to choose a side. This conflict, called the Schism War, lasted six standard years, ending when Lorgar and his supporters stormed the Temple of the Covenant, known as the Cathedral of Illumination in the heart of the capital city of Veradash, at which the Primarch had once trained. They killed the monks within, and eliminated the heart of the Covenant's conservative religious resistance to this idea concerning the One God. Possibly as part of this conflict, or after it, one-third of the people of Colchis were said to have turned against Lorgar, and the first great purge was conducted by the Brotherhood's fanatical loyal warrior monks who had been handpicked by Lorgar. Now the ruling archpriest of the Reformed Covenant, Lorgar promised the masses that their new god would arrive on Colchis no more than a local year after the victory, 
and that they would know him only as the Emperor. Corpharon confessed to his adopted son that he remained a believer in the other gods of the old faith, but that he also believed, like Lorgar, that the one god was the most powerful of their numbers. This continued belief in the old faith, also maintained by the other Caucasians after the Godsworn's victory, would lay the foundations of the word bearers and eventually Lorgar's turn to chaos. Now let's move on to Percherabo. Percherabo landed on the civilized world of Olympia. It was an ancient human colonized planet in the marshes of the Ultima Segmentum, on the opposing side of the galactic core from Terra. It was one of a number of worlds in this region heavily settled during the Dark Age of Technology, having survived the Age of Strife largely intact. Scientific lore and industry on Olympia had regressed to a fractured but largely pre-atomic industrial level. Most of it remained stagnant as sophisticated feudal cultures developed. Although relatively rich in organics and with a plethora of lithic mineral forms, much of its materials and easily available conductive metals had been stripped away and removed off-world, serving to restrict Olympia's progression technologically. Further complicating matters was the almost unbroken mountainous terrain which dominated Olympia's land masses and made large-scale urbanization and agriculture impossible. These unique conditions bred an equally singular culture, which evolved into a diverse patchwork of hundreds of independent city-states. These dominated and fought endlessly over the most fertile mountain valleys, sizable plateaus, and rich valves in a shifting web of power and warfare. A secular, opportunistic culture Given to the pursuit of wealth, security, and dominance, the Olympian arts of war evolved towards a sublime mastery of fortress building, siege craft, and stone masonry. On Olympia, power was the ability not only to take resources, but to defend them. The mountainous terrain created abundance of high quality stone, and the artisanship to put it to use made the fashioning of elaborate keeps to guard vital passes, and citadels to defend stockpiles of wealth and foodstuff essential. These artificer-created defenses were of murderous cunning and impregnable strength, and soon came to be the hallmark and measure of the greatest of the city-states and their rulers. Twelve of the most powerful became dubbed by ancient traditions as the tyrants of Olympia. Warfare in this fractured realm was a complex game of cunning political espionage and assassinations mixed with all-out assaults. Olympia's wars were fought between mercenary armies of professional sellswords, Sieges were carried out by steel-plated creeper tanks, clanking steaming mortars, and hulking scout airships held aloof by volatile gases. The warlords who commanded Olympia's battles were only as loyal as the wealthiest of the tyrants. Individuals whose rule was carried by the right of possession, bribery, and fear. It was to the court of one of these tyrants, Damakos of the city-states of Lokos, that the young Percherabo was found. The full details of this early period in Percherabo's life remain somewhat mysterious. The most reliable accounts point to Percherabo as having been recovered from the rocky wilds outside the city-state by the tyrant's guard. They had been pursuing tales of a strange and wondrous boy wandering between outlying minor settlements and outcast communities. The boy was making his way both as a fighter for hire and as an artisan of phenomenal talent despite his great youth staying in no one place for any length of time before moving on. Tales of the boy had reached the court of Lokos and Damakos. A shrewd and cunning ruler, he had been intrigued enough to dispatch his retainers to find if any truth was in these rumors, and if so, how could he turn it to his advantage? Percherabo was discovered climbing the mountains below the walls of Lokos. This event in Percherabo's life became his first memory. As the Primarch climbed and finally reached the summit, the exhausted boy peered towards the heavens and gazed upon a strange, nebulous stellar maelstrom erupting across a corner of the heavens. By this point, the tyrant's guard had reached the young Primarch, and Percherabo asked them whether they could also see the strange phenomenon. The bewildered guard replied that they could not. The guards realized that this was no ordinary child and took him back to Damakos the ruling tyrant of Lokos. On seeing the strange boy in the flash, Damakos put him to the test. Witnessing his ability to defeat warriors twice his size and many times his age, while at the same time, the ability to solve any puzzle put to him by the tyrant's own scholars. Damakos was intrigued enough to offer the boy a place in his court. 
between the boy and the tyrant, a bargain was struck. Fealty, loyalty, and service on the boy's part, and on the other, patronage and protection and access to the finest military training and scholarship the tyrant's resources could offer him. Account of what happened next differ. Some paint the boy as a true prodigy, frustrated at the fact that Olympia had nothing to teach him. Others say he spent his life in an unending regime of solitary training and devouring whatever learning and lore was set before him, or he couldn't dig out himself to study. But most accounts make vile references to a child who was both cold and devious, the rapidly growing boy never fully accepting his lot, never truly trusting the Olympians, and refusing to return any affection given to him by his adopted father. However, there was a mysterious explanation for Perturabo's inherent mistrust. It was the maelstrom that continued to look down upon the Primarch, making him feel as if he was being judged and measured his worth and spied on every movement. A life lived beneath this cold scrutiny made him brooding and loath to offer his trust, ever watchful and aware of the baleful glare. It would be over two standard centuries later before he understood what this stellar maelstrom was. In truth, it was a giant rift between real space and the immaterium. It would later be known as the Eye of Terror. Many Olympians saw the boy as a particularly cold and brooding child though the fact that he was a genetically engineered superhuman who had been mysteriously thrown onto a strange world with no idea of his origin or purpose was certainly not conducive to the development of a trusting nature. Despite his demeanor, the adopted boy learned from the culture in which he found himself, for Olympia's warring city-states afforded plenty of opportunity to study both the theory and the practice of this highly specialized branch of warfare known as the Art of Siege. Once he became of age, he was allowed to choose his adult name, but against the customs, he chose not to honor the family into which he had been taken into. Instead, he chose an ancient name that he had long favored, a name that some claim had been found in a forgotten text from before the fall of humanity, a text written in the language only the boy was able to successfully translate, Perturabo. What true meaning it held, he did not divulge. Imperial scholars argue as to the true meaning of his name. Some point to ancient Terran texts from occultist writing, which translates Perturabo as meaning I will endure, while at the same time using the prefix perturb, meaning to make someone anxious. Perhaps this was the Primarch's way of explaining that he would endure despite the anxiety caused by the ever-present maelstrom. Nevertheless, to war the young Primarch went. His adopted father was a powerful tyrant, but he and his realm were beset by rivals and bitter vendettas on all sides, and having given an oath, Damakos' enemies were now Perturabos. Granted first minor commands, the young Primarch ascended the ranks of his adopted house's armies at a frightening rate. Victory after victory followed under his command, and his legend grew, as did the mercenaries and war artisans flocking to the banner of Damakos in their lust for success and plunder. But more than mere success in battle did Perturabo bring to Locos, and even from the beginning was his genius noted not simply for war, but also invention, having absorbed with superhuman clarity the breadth and depth of Olympia's science and artisanship. He soon surpassed it on every level, and from his chambers a constant stream of blueprints and discoveries sprung encompassing everything from revolutionary new machines to treaties on architecture and production methods and even groundbreaking works on medicine and astronomy. But it was first and foremost by the advance in warfare that Perturabo's dark fame was bred and his legend as the Hammer of Olympia was born. New weapons, munitions, and unimaginable siege engines were all birthed at Perturabo's hand, and in a brief span of years, Perturabo made Locos the most powerful and feared domain on Olympia, with a hundred others underneath his heel and countless more cowed in de facto submission to its rulers. Perturabo's score upon score of military victories brought no peace to Locos, however, only dominance, and the growing threat of an enemy within, the assassin's blade, and the prisoner's kiss grew. It is believed that a great many attempts were carried out upon the Lord of Iron during this time both by subjugated tyrants, reasoning that without Perturabo, the city-state's supremacy would crumble, 
and by those to Percherabo's face called him family and friends, but who secretly held him in terror or jealous hatred. The Primarch now fully grown towered over them, all both in stature and intellect, but cared little of the trappings of power. Prideful and justly wary of friend and enemy alike, Percherabo is depicted during this time as being a particularly bloody-handed warlord even by the standards of his world, to whom mercy was an alien concept and who would meet any insult with murderous violence. The steel executioner's mask and the ancient Cavathos heraldry warning death to the transgressor were Percherabo signed and sealed and promising savage punishment in repayment of failure by those beneath him, just as it promised death to his enemies. Despite the fact that should he have wished it, Percherabo could have overthrown his master, Damakos, and displaced him as a tyrant, he did not do so. The Primarch, it seemed, could not break his word or his bargain willingly, and Damakos, for all his vain glory and corruption, was careful never to give him cause or excuse to do so. It is thought, Perhaps that true to his oath, Percherabo would have left the aging Damakos die a natural death as he remained unprovoked, hastened by the tyrant's own excesses before taking Locos and then all of Olympia as his own in time. What he would have made this whole world can only be guessed at, for it was not to be, as a new star had been seen in the heavens. It was the emperor who had come for his lost son. Now let's take a look at the Primarch Mortarion. The Primarch Mortarion came to rest on the planet of Barbarus. All the worlds upon which the Primarchs were scattered, few were as terrible a place as this damned feral world, orbiting near a dim yellow sun in the Segmentum Tempestis. It created a thick, miasmic atmosphere of toxic chemicals. The most virulent of these gases rose through Barbarus's perpetual clouds towards the heat of its star, making the world beneath a dismal place of night unbroken by starlight and possessed of short, shadowy days. When humans first settled barbarous during the Dark Age of Technology, the horrific environmental conditions from which they eked out a living quickly reduced them to a brief feudal state. Unfortunately, the Age of Strife separated the planet from the rest of humanity. Quickly, the world became the domain of savage, alien overlords who ruled over and entrapped and preyed upon human population as cruel and terrible gods. The only atmosphere breathable by humans existed only in the lowest elevations, on flat moors, and in the valley basins of the jagged, stony mountains which spine the world. These unknown alien overlords were immune to the toxic soup of the planet's upper atmosphere, building great keeps of grey stone in the mountain's fastness. The true nature of these dark overlords, beyond their obvious connection to the dark entities of the Immaterium, will likely never be known. What is known? is that they reveled in the death of the humans that cowered from their power. One of the greatest of these overlords stood in triumph over a freshly murdered battlefield, reveling in his massacre until the silence was shattered by a child's cry. Legend tells that the warlord walked the sea of corpses for a day and night in his creaking bad armor, drawn by the wails of the infant. When he finally found him, he considered ending its young life, but no mere human ought to be able to breathe the poisonous miasma at the height of Barbarous, much less cry out as this child did. For a long moment, he contemplated this thing which appeared to be human, but was clearly much more. He chose to gather up the infant and carry him away from the carnage. For all his dark power, until that moment, he had not had what this child now promised, a son, an heir, born of death upon a field of death, the warlord christened the infant Mortarion, the child of death. When Mortarion was taken by the overlord, his master tested the infant's limits. When he determined precisely how high into the toxic clouds of Barbarus's peaks the child could survive, he erected a stony keep and fenced it behind black iron. He then moved his own home beyond to the highest peak where the atmosphere was deadly even to the new Primarch. Mortarion grew to adolescence in such a world a citadel of weeping grey stone and cast iron fences, where the very air was death and the sun never more than a distant smudge. It was a world of constant war against opposing lords, who came with golem armies of stitched together dead one day, then tormented shapeshifters, more monster than men the next. While the Primarch 
or shaped by this environment, he was still a child of the Emperor, superhumanly resilient to the poisonous air around him, and superhumanly strong even in the absence of sufficient sunlight or nourishment. Mortarion possessed an intellect which was highly keen, and which asked questions his lord did not want to answer. Increasingly, the questions centered around the fragile things in the valley below, which the warlord preyed upon for their corpses to reanimate, or victims to occur. The warlord kept Mortarion as distant from the human settlements as he could, but his very act of denial fed the maturing Primarch's obsession. The day finally came when Mortarion would not be denied any longer. Mortarion slipped through the dungeons from his keep. The last thing he heard was the voice of the Overlord, the only father he had known. Roaring in the miasmic darkness from the highest battlement as Mortarion descended from the mountain, he renounced the Primarch for his betrayal warning Mortarion that should he return, it would mean death. Descending beneath the mist was a revelation to Mortarion. His lungs were filled with air free of poison from the first time. He smelled aromas of food being prepared, of crops freshly harvested, hearing voices unmuffled by the fog, and for the first time, heard laughter. The young Primarch realized that he was amongst his own kind, that the fragile prey of the warlord were his own people. And with that realization came rage. He was determined to bring them the justice denied by the dark powers which moved above. Mortarion's acceptance amongst the human settlers of Barbarus was no simple thing. While he felt like one of them, to them he was little different from the monsters above. Towering over even the tallest of his fellow Barbarans, gaunt and pallid, with hollow, haunted eyes which betrayed the horrors he had seen, Mortarion terrified most of the settlers. They looked upon him with suspicion and fear. It stung the young Primarch, but he bit his time, using his great strength to work the fields for their meager harvest, knowing that his opportunity to prove himself would soon come. When it finally did, in the twilight hours, he was ready. The village was eventually attacked by a lesser lord and his corpse army. The villagers fought back with their farmer's tools and torches, or unable to prevent the shambling creatures from carrying out their master's dark purposes. Mortarion then strode forth, a large, two-handed scythe in his hand, and charged into the ranks of the enemy and annihilated them with the Primarch's born rage. Their dark lord smiled at Mortarion as the Primarch neared, withdrawing into the poisonous heights where he thought his rebellious human could not reach him. He was still wearing his contemptuous smile when Mortarion caught up with him on the mountainside and exacted his vengeance for the frail prey below. After that night, Mortarion's place among the settlers was never endowed. As he matured, Mortarion taught the settlers of Barbarus what he knew of warfare. Word of his exploits spread, and many others made the perilous journey to learn. Slowly, villages became strong points, and the villagers more effective defenders. Eventually, Mortarion went amongst the people, traveling from settlement to settlement, teaching, building, and when occasion demanded, defending them. Always, however, his ultimate justice was denied. The dark powers could always retreat into their impregnable bulwark of their poisonous mists. His people could only fight in defense, but that had to change. Mortarion recruited the toughest, most resilient of Barbarus's population, forging them into small units which he drilled himself teaching them not only defense, but also how to attack. He turned blacksmiths from tool working to weapon making when time allowed, and crafters to the shape of armor. And with the best artificers he could find, he bent his formidable intellect to the problem of the poisonous air. When one of the overlords descended from the poisonous fog blanketing the mountainside, the villagers not only managed to mount a successful defense, but were led by Mortarion into the poisonous fog where the Overlord's army thought it would escape the marauding humans. Massed with crude filtering hoses and breathing apparatuses, the Primarch led his retinue to bring death in the realm of death. They killed the Warlord and massacred his army. The Primarch continued to improve the breathing apparatuses of his new Death Guard as his retinue of warriors came to be known. Campaigning ever higher into the darker Overlord's domain, encountering ever more virulent pestilence, the constant exposure to the higher doses of toxins toughened the Death Guard. Mortarion and his army 
warred for solar months across the poisonous spines of Barbarous, until only one grim but very familiar citadel stood against them. The concentration of poisonous toxins was such that they threatened to overcome the Death Guard and the Primarch himself, forcing him to withdraw. Mortarion would not get vengeance against his adopted father until the Emperor arrived. Let's move on to another one of my favorite Primarchs, Magnus. When the young Primarch, Magnus the Red, was scattered across the stars, he landed on the planet of Prospero. Chosen by its settlers for the planet's isolated position, although it still remained far closer to Terra than many other human colonies settled around the Dark Age of Technology, the civilized world of Prospero had only a few redeemable qualities. It possessed no independent resources, little contact with any outsider, and only a few sources of nourishment. The only reason for planting a colony there because it was a very good place to hide, and thus became a large community of psychically talented and often physically mutated humans who would find no safety elsewhere in the galaxy. Although the planet protected the settlers from those that wished to see them dead, the strong psychic presence of the population attracted the rare but deadly warp entities known as Psychnuans. Resembling huge, spindly wasps, these warp insects were drawn to the souls of the unprotected or badly injured psychers. They then would lay their eggs inside the brains of the novice psychers and watch their progeny eat away at the psychers' brain. This Psychnuan plague persisted until the civilization of Prospero collapsed and the survivors fled to the city of Tisca. For thousands of Terran years, the people of Tisca endured, while all they had built in the millennia since leaving Terra fell to dust. The surface of Prospero was dotted with the remains of dead culture. Empty cities were overgrown with forests and vines, the palaces of their kings overrun with wild beasts. Those that remained survived by salvaging knowledge and equipment. They constructed techno-psychic arrays and substantial energy sources, which then allowed them to build giant hydroponic gardens deep in the caverns of the mountain ranges. They survived the Psychnuan threat by further developing the very psychic powers that made them so vulnerable. The Psychnuans were drawn to Tisca in their thousands, but the survivors were able to train their most gifted psychers to use their minds to erect invisible barriers of pure thought. They were known as kin shields. They were primitive, bombastic powers compared to the subtle arts later employed by the Thousand Sons, but they kept the creatures at bay. Even so, the practitioners of the mysteries remained locked in their limited understanding of the Immaterium's power, that is until the arrival of the Primarch. When Magnus fell from the sky, he landed on the central plaza of Tisca. It is said that the impact he had on the people of Prospero was as great as the gestation capsule's impact upon the planet's crust. The little enclave took in the Primarch, known as the Tiscan Commune. It was a place rooted in tradition, but they had very little skills in wielding the power known as Ether. Of course, they did not know it by that name, and the power they had, well enough to keep the psych predators at bay, were little more than the enchantments of idiot children. The young Primarch was schooled in the ways of the commune by his tutor, Magistus Amon. He quickly learned everything they had to teach him. Magnus endured Amon's tutorials and sermons regarding the powers of the war. Amon referred to it as the Great Ocean. His teacher was also kind to him, even after Magnus outstripped him in learning and powers at an early age. Yet, Amon warned Magnus of peering too deeply into the ocean's depths. In truth, Magnus had outstripped the learning of Prosperian's greatest scholars within a standard year of his arrival. Their teachings were too dogmatic, too linear, and too limited to the potential of the Primarch's mind. His intellect was superior in every way to those that taught him. Magnus knew that with his teachings, he could be so much more. To increase his understanding of the powerful psychic abilities, Magnus took a walk into the waste of Prospero. True power comes only to those who have fully tested themselves against their greatest fears. Within the commune of Tisca, the Primarch knew no fear, no hunger, no want, and had no drive to push his abilities to their full potential. Magnus needed to be tested to the very limits of his power to see if he even had limits. Out in the wild, Magnus knew that he would either find the key to fully unlock his powers or die in the attempt. A year after his coming to Prospero, the Primarch walked from the gates of Tisca and marched into the wilderness for nearly 40 solar days. 
Through his observations, Magnus learned to harness his powerful abilities during this long track. He had already begun his second grimoire when Amon had come upon the young Primarch squatting amongst a carpet of stones fallen from a ruined statue, the remains of Prospero's past. Amon was much moved and began to write poetry about each of the incredible designs and patterns of the scattered stones. Magnus believed that there were hidden designs amongst the shards of rock there, the workings of the universe laid bare. Together, Amon and Magnus returned home, where he read his poetry, and the Primarch showed the masters of Tisca the workings in his grimoire. So amazed were they that they joined Magnus on a pilgrimage back to the cliff, where the remains of the fallen statues were located. The shards were just as he had described them. The masters of Tisca were overcome with emotion filling their own grimoires with fantastical writing. Some wrote about the triangles, others described the circles, while yet others concentrated all their attention on the glittering spectrums of color stones. Temporarily lax in their mental discipline, the Psychnuans were drawn to the large commune of Psychers, and in the thousands they came, blackening the sky with their numbers as they descended like a plague from ancient times. They swarmed from their darkened caves, organically shifting clouds of deadly clades, the relentless buzzing of thousands of crystalline wings, representing the sound of inevitable doom. The male swarmed in, a hurricane of snapping mandibles and tearing claws, and fifty men died in the time it took to draw breath. Behind the males came the females, engorged with clutch after clutch of immaterial eggs. Their furious reproductive hunger was insatiable, and dozens of the Primarch's friends fell to their knees in horror as they felt the Psychnuan eggs take root in their brains. The beasts swirled around them, battering the Prosperians with psychic thrusts, scrambling at their mental barriers to seed their minds with eggs, and only the strongest of them remained. Amon and the eight of the Psychic Masters of Tisca stood with the Primarch. Magnus knew this was what he had been seeking all along, the true test of his abilities. Magnus would see if he was the master of his powers, or was found wanting. As the Psychnuans came to the Prosperian defenders again, something magnificent happened. The Primarch felt something move within him, feeling change as though an immense power had laid within him, dormant and untapped, it surged to life. As Magnus contemplated the moment of his death, raging fires erupted from his hands. The Primarch hurled torrents of flame into the sky. As though he had always known he had such a power, he killed hundreds of Psychnuans with every gesture. Soon, the other Tiskin masters displayed hence unknown abilities as well, as walls of flame sprang up at their mental command. Others were able to pluck beasts from the air and dash them on rocks with the powers of their mind. Still other defenders were able to will the vital fluids within the Psychnuans to boil within their exoskeleton. Amon saw images of the future as he cried out words of warning to his fellows, telling them of dangers to come and how they might avoid them. Some of the other defenders sensed the lust within the Psychnuans to plant their psychic seed within the humans, the relentless animal hunger that drove them to feed and propagate. They reached into the minds of the beast and twisted their perceptions so that they became blind to the humans. Coming out victorious from this vicious Psychnuan attack, Magnus and the Masters regrouped and soon set off on a campaign to rid the planet of the Psychnuan threat. After that, the Primarch was elevated to the leader of Prospero. Magnus unified its sometimes squabbling cults of sorcerers and set about rebuilding Prospero's civilization. Tisca, the capital, was transformed into a city of breathtaking beauty. Beautifully designed buildings in the form of pyramids and towers, composed of glass and marble, wide boulevards, paradise-like parks, and a constant pleasing psychic background resulted in the immediate bliss for all visitors. This period of peace, prosperity, and psychic well-being reflected on the world's population of powerful psychers, and Prospero became known as a planet of psychically and spiritually beautiful humans. Magnus also set himself the task of consolidating and expanding the prosperous knowledge of the warp. To further this goal, Magnus built in the center of Tisca a great library within a magnificent pyramid where all of the knowledge of the Prosperan gain about both sorcery and the nature of the warp was kept. Brushing aside the warnings of his wise teacher, Amon, about the dangers of delving too deep into the Immaterium, Magnus undertook long and far-reaching psychic journeys into the furthest reaches of the warp. 
wouldn't be long before he would find the Emperor of Mankind. Now let's talk about Conrad Kurz. According to the heretical handwritten chronicles of his life, the Primarch Conrad Kurz's earliest memory was descending from the heavens in a crackling ball of light to the night-shrouded planet of Nostromo. His embryotic form's gestation capsule crudely ripped through the warp from distant Terra by the schemes of the Chaos Gods. It impacted on the dense cityscape of the planet's largest hive city of Nostromo's Quintus, smashing through countless levels of urban debris and moldering architecture through the planet's crust and into the geosphere before finally coming to a halt near the highly unstable liquid core of the planet. Nostromo was a human-settled world that circled a dying sun whose light now only barely reached the world, leaving it trapped in a perpetual darkness. The crust of Nostromo bore high quantities of the strategic mineral adamantium, which provided the basis of the planet's immense mining and refining industries and supported the economies of its larger hive cities. The vast majority of the planet's population lived in poverty, toiling in the mines while the rich grew affluent, exploiting the already downtrodden workers. Crime ran mostly unchecked, clinical depression was inescapable for most because of the constant darkness, and overpopulation was kept in check more by suicide than any other measure. The Primarch's capsule left a scar in the virtually invaluable adamantium strata of Nostromo, the result of a supernaturally resilient Primarch's violent birth into a world that knew no light. The cratered pit his descent had carved into the planet was closed over and later regarded with fear and superstition. Theoretically, the only way the Primarch could have reached the surface was to have swum up from the molten metal or have his gestation capsule bore upward through the volcanic vents to the surface. Unlike many of the other Primarchs, Curse was not taken in by any family and was left to raise himself in the vast underhive of the largest hive cities on the planet. He spent his early life surviving off his wits and determination, feeding himself by hunting the feral animals that roamed through the vast hive city. During this time, he was continually plagued by visions of the darkest possible future, horrifically potent waking dreams that would curse him throughout his life. As a lone young boy, feral and wary, Kerr shivered in the shadows of broken buildings and atop roofs, living as a scavenger and slaying any who sought to prey upon him, for even as an infant, he possessed frightful strength and an amazing will married to a superhuman and watchful intelligence. The cries of people pleading under the tortured knives were his cradle songs, and when he slept, he would dream of wars waiting in the stars. The dead heaped on worlds he had never seen, and he would wake with the screams of dying in his ears and find that they were real. Ever in the dark, isolated and silent, he was more of a nightmare than a demigod. He killed to survive and discover that he was not like those he killed. They were weak and slow by comparison, and fell easily to his hands, fists, and teeth. He ate the flesh of vermin to survive, and when that was not enough, he ate the dead. In his cauldron of sin he learned, his mind taking the whispers of thoughts from the flesh he ate, leeching speech, and the arts of murder from those he watched. He soaked up all that darkness could teach him, assimilating it as only the mind of a transhuman primarch could. But the product of this savage tutelage was not a simple murderer or beast. Perhaps something of the Emperor's greatest purpose whispered to Kurz. He could have become like the rest of Nostromo, a killer and a criminal. Given his nature, who can doubt he had risen to the corrupt king of all that he surveyed? But he did not. Instead, the boy who had grown up amongst the vermin and on the flesh of the dead chose to change the world by bringing it justice. He began by killing those who crossed his path. Sin had surrounded him since he had first drawn breath. There was no need to seek it out. Murderers and street thugs began to vanish, then whole gangs. Bodies appeared, mutilated and crucified on the walls of buildings. Flayed sheets of skin hung from the bridges and severed heads grinning from railings. A name began to follow his deeds, a name that he heard the people of his world whisper half in fear and half in hope. Nighthaunter was the fearful name they gave him, an avenging spirit, an angel of blind justice, a murderer other murderers feared. They began to hunt him, the gangs, the noble enforcers, the crime collectives alike, and this suited him, for if nothing had brought his prey to him. He killed most who came after him, 
and let a few live to carry the message back to Nostromo's nefarious courts and princes. Without eyes, without hands, but left their tongues, the mutilated messengers would weep out a simple message, I am coming for you. The Night Haunter followed the whispers, the rumors, and the truths that came from the mouths of flayed gangers. His vigilante actions began small, intervening when he witnessed something he believed to be wrong, but rapidly escalating into hunting down those he believed had committed transgressions. At first, several people prominent within Nostromo's Quintus' corrupt civic hierarchy disappeared. Leaders of the most vocal oppositions to the status quo vanished in similar circumstances. Bodies of known criminals began to appear, gutted like fish by some cruel assailant. Corrupt officials were found hung from high windows. Body parts blocked stormwater drains. Many of the corpses found were so horribly beaten by their assailant that identification was impossible. Within the year, the crime rate of Nostromo Quintus fell to nearly zero. He killed and mutilated until the streets fell quiet and his name was no longer a prayer for justice, but a plea for the fearful. An entire world had been cowed by sheer terror. When the city slept in silence, and the sound of gunfire was a rare murmur, he went before the aristocracy of sin and gave them a choice. Kneel and follow his law, or be destroyed. Some never left the first council, the rest knelt before their master. Nostromo belonged to the Night Hunter. he would be the first king, their dark king, and became the first absolute monarch Nostromo had ever known, absorbing accumulated knowledge with a diligence almost akin to greed. He ruled with temperance and reason, until a word came to him that some injustice had been done, whereupon he alone would hunt the offender through the Hive City's empty streets, until exhaustion forced his quarry to collapse. He would then proceed to mutilate his prey, although not beyond recognition. This unpredictable pattern of benevolent wisdom and hideous vengeance ushered the shock Nostromen populace into a new realm of efficiency and honesty. Exports of adamantium to their neighboring world soon tripled. Nostromen society came to exist in a terrible balance, maintained by shared wealth and shared fear. None dared to have more than their neighbors, and under the shadow of the Night Hunter's rule, the city grew well lit and prosperous. As Nostromo Quintus led the way, the rest of the planet's population followed, anxious to keep the Night Hunter from their doors. After a few decades, he no longer had to hunt, as the passing years had stolen the need. Curse's city had become a silent hive, illuminated by the light of progress. No crime, no sin had been committed in decades. The last visages of anarchy and resistance had died out soon after he began to broadcast his mutilations across the city via the Pictor interfaces available in every home, transmitting his victim screams over the planetary communication networks. Those executions recorded in his throne room ended what little crime remained. His people knew their superhuman ruler would take to the streets in vengeance at the slightest provocation. In their fear, the last souls holding out finally accepted the salvation he offered them. Nostromo continued to trade its abundance of adamantium with the worlds and neighboring star systems, which they had done so for generations, though under the Night Haunter's kingship, planetary exports rose to unparalleled levels, as did the profits of such endeavors. The city's foundries and forge fires burned hotter, the refineries and processing plants spread across the urban sprawl, and the mines clawed ever deeper into Nostromo's priceless crust. And we can't forget about Angron. During the scattering of the Primarch's gestation capsules from the Emperor of Mankind's gene laboratories deep beneath the Himalayan mountains on Terra, Angron was deposited through the warp to the civilized world of Nusaria. Where this planet is located in the galaxy, or if it even still exists, is uncertain, though most signs seem to point to somewhere in the Ultima Segmentum. Imperial savant speak of Angron's world as technologically advanced and ruled over by a wealthy elite who lived in decadent opulence while the populace of their cities lived in poverty in the slums that surrounded their palaces and villas. To distract the populace from their poverty, the oligarch rulers of Nusaria held regular gladiatorial death matches in massive arenas, using cybernetically enhanced gladiators who battled to satisfy the endless bloodlust of the oppressed people. 
Each coliseum represented the terrible inequality present on Nuceria. While hundreds of gladiators fought for their lives each day in the arena floor, the crowds up above them were further divided as the Nucerian classes were. Nucerian lords and priests had the best seats in the arena. Seating amongst these elites depended on their influence and how many gladiator slaves they owned. This was done to show the spectators how important each lord was. Higher up sat all the individuals who were not owners of the gladiators, but facilitated in their keeping. Trainers, off-duty guards, and Nucerian nobles with a keen eye for buying or selling potential champions that saw battle in the arena. Above them were the Nucerian civilians, who saw the savagery of the battles as a means to cope with their pitiful lives. Three events took place in an ordinary show day. First was a beast show in the morning. This was when two creatures, most often captured in the wilds of Nuceria or from a neighboring planet, would be forced to tear each other apart for the enjoyment of the crowd. The second event was the execution of criminals at midday. Often, Nuceria nobles that came from poorer houses accused of petty crimes. They were tortured or fed to the winning beast of the morning show. This gave the crowds a false sense of satisfaction at seeing what they believed as highborn Nucerians killed for their satisfaction. Peasant civilians were rarely executed in the arena unless the crime angered the populace. The third and most popular event was the gladiatorial combats in the afternoon. The crowds were attending mainly for the entertainment of these games. They were seen as proper shows with professionally trained combatants. The spectators of the arenas were dangerously bloodthirsty during each battle. The crowds would often cheer for more blood and more sacrifice after each death. It was on this world that the Primarch Angron was eventually discovered. He plummeted into the icy mountains of the planet. Not long after, a slaver found him in a scene of carnage. Surrounding the wounded young Primarch were the corpses of numerous Xenos. Imperial scholars would later theorize that they were Eldar who had foreseen the great bloodshed that Angron would cause and had tried to unsuccessfully stop him. The young Angron had been badly wounded in combat but remained alive. Taken as a slave, the young boy was brought to the palace of Praxica, the seat of Rexium throne of the powerful Nucerian city-state of Deshe, where he was sold to the ruling clan, the Thalker. The youth's obvious potential as a gladiator was soon made apparent, and he was soon bought by the largest and most powerful arena in the capital. The young Primarch was given a name, Angron Thalkir, and nursed back to health. His name meant Child of the Mountain and property of House Thalkir. During his life as a slave, he befriended an older gladiator by the name Onimus. He became the closest thing to a father figure the young Primarch had. With Onimus's teachings, and Angron's raw power, the Primarch became a famed gladiator known as the Unbeaten and a favorite of the crowds. Unfortunately, after battling and defeating a pair of berserker Ogrens, the masters of the arena ordered the two gladiators to fight one another to the death. Angron refused, and his masters ordered that he undergo a psychosurgery known as the Butcher's Nails' as punishment. He then received the bioneurical cybernetic implants. These were hammered into the Primarch's skull and surgically grafted to his cerebral cortex. Relic devices from the dark age of technology, these cortical implants would boost a warrior's adrenaline, resulting in greater strength and aggression in battle. They bleached a warrior's mind of all reason, all caution, and all instinct of morality. The nails rewarded rage with spurts of electrochemical pleasure, tingling synapses, and deadening enjoyment of everything else. No better machine had ever been contrived. Upon receiving the Butcher's Nails, Angron was set loose on Onimus, and he killed him in a blind frenzy. When Angron finally regained his senses, the despair of his revelation caused him to unleash a bestial howl for days. The cells below the massive arena were home to several thousand gladiators, all implanted with the Butcher's Nails, and Angron took his place amongst them. After only a few months, Angron Thalkir had become a proud warrior with fearsome skills an even stronger sense of honor, known to the crowds as the Lord of the Red Sands. He killed hundreds of other gladiators, but those who fought well he always spared. Although Angron seemed to enjoy the life of a gladiator and the adoration of the crowd, he secretly resented his slavery and was always plotting to escape. 
he proved to be a troublesome champion, prone to attempt escaping whenever he saw an occasion, but such efforts always failed. Within a few standard years, Angron's fame had spread to every corner of his homeworld. Under his training, the gladiators of his arena soon became the greatest the world had ever seen, and none could stand against them. Yet Angron also learned, following a final failed escape attempt, that he would never succeed alone. His unbending warrior code and sheer combat skills had made him a well-respected leader amongst the other gladiators, and when the largest death games ever held on Nusaria were announced, Angron planned his most daring escape attempt. For these new games, Angron was allowed to stage a vast combat that would involve every gladiator in his arena. As the crowds drowned out the sound of battle, Angron's gladiators turned on their armed guards, butchering them and fighting their way to freedom. Against the guards, who were armed with firearms, the gladiators' casualties were extremely high, but nearly 2,000 survived to escape into the streets of the city, stealing what weapons and supplies they could before fleeing into the northern mountains where Angron had first been discovered. Over the next few years, the rulers of the world dispatched many armed forces to kill or recapture the rebel slaves, who soon named themselves the eaters of cities, but all were destroyed in turn by Angron's leadership, martial skill, and the cybernetically enhanced fury of the gladiators. But attrition and hunger slowly took their toll on the slaves, and eventually only 1,000 men and women remained, half the size of the original force of escapees. On a mountain named Fedden Moor, on a bleak spit of land known as Desh Elika Ridge, Angron and his forces were finally surrounded by no less than five large Nusarian armies. Not even the Primarch could stand against such sheer numbers. Yet it was at this time that the Emperor of Mankind came to this world, brought by the psychic emanations of his gene son, the Primarch. Let's move on to the Primarch Fulgrim. Like all of the Primarchs, Fulgrim was teleported away from Terra while still an infant due to the schemes of the Chaos Gods who hoped to prevent the coming of the Age of the Imperium. Fulgrim's gestation capsule came to rest on a resource-poor mining world known as Chemos. The world of Chemos was in the Ultima Segmentum's Aquitaine sector, and it was originally settled by human colonists before the Age of Strive. When warp travel became impossible due to the numerous warp storms that cut off the human-settled world from one another, it forced these isolated worlds to fend for themselves without the support of their human-settled neighbors in other star systems. In ancient surviving texts from that time, known as the Librum Ex Dominar, tells that Chemos was one such world, an industrious mining colony dependent on interstellar trade for food. The planet's rulers made every effort to extract enough raw food from the harsh environment to feed their people. Chemos was a world dying a slow death. During its isolation, the archivist of Chemos recorded a picture of a bleak, unforgiving world, worn by two small, distant suns and surrounded by a nebular dust cloud. It experienced neither day nor night, only a perpetual gray twilight in which the stars never shone. Settled long ago as a mining colony, the city outposts, mining centers, and towns of Chemos had fallen into decay since the isolation from Terra. Without resources from other worlds to sustain its people, trade with other worlds ended, thousands starved, cities were abandoned, and eventually it fell down to a few hardy fortress factories to keep humanity alive on Chemos. Short of food, water, and energy, the people of the planet were forced to limit themselves to the meager supplies available. All citizens worked every waking hour, operating the vapor mines that drew moisture from the thin air, and the huge synthesizers that endlessly recycled food, turning yesterday's waste into today's substance. When not working, the inhabitants of the factory fortresses would march through the ruins of once great industrial cities, searching for building material, technology, and the ruins of spaceships to strip of useful parts. Recreation, art, and leisure were sacrificed in order to ensure survival and efficiency became the value adhered to. This all changed when one day, the guards on the crumbling walls of Calax, the largest remaining factory fortress, saw a meteor descend from the clouds. Trailing fire across the skies before impacting into the rocky, dusty ground barely a mile from the fortress walls. Though little manpower could be spared, 
The ruling executive of Kallax sent a handful of scouts to investigate the impact site, hoping for evidence of human survivors on other worlds. What they found became legend. Tulea, Corin, and Sulax were laborers that were sent to investigate the meteor impact. Sent without transport, the three had to take shelter from a wire storm in an abandoned factory. When they reached the impact site, they didn't find a fallen satellite or a spacecraft. They found an ever-shifting mass of light. Sulax was wary, but Corin felt that it was harmless. Corin watched the light take shape, and it touched his mind, learning everything he did before it took the shape of a perfectly formed baby boy. Orphans were normally put to death on camos. The executive spared no resources to look after those who were unable to return their investment by working in the factory fortresses. The captain of the scouts looked into the eyes of the child and saw something more than human. In defiance of tradition, the captain of the scout appealed to the executive. Because of his value to Kallax, the captain was allowed to adopt the infant as his own. He named his adopted son after an old legend long since discarded by the people of Camos, the mythical god of creation, Volgrum. The child named after this legend soon created a legend of his own one that would become known to all the people of the world. Fulgrim grew unnaturally fast, becoming a strong, capable man. At half the age of his fellow workers, he was able to fulfill his obligations to the executive, working for days without rest. Not only was he physically proficient, he quickly grew to understand the technology of the machines he worked with, and began to contemplate their improvement. By the 15th anniversary of his fall from the sky, Fulgrim had risen from the ranks of the workers, first becoming an engineer, then one of the executives itself. Learning of the slow deterioration in Kallax and the other remaining settlements of Camos, Fulgrim set himself the task of saving his world and changing it from a dying ex-mining planet into the center of art and wealth it became under imperial rule. One by one, he convinced his fellow members of the executive board to fight against entropy that was destroying the planet. Under Fulgrim's leadership, teams of engineers traveled far from the factory fortresses, reclaiming and repopulating long-dead outposts, mining centers, and fortresses in the planet's most inaccessible regions. The ancient mines were reopened and expanded, bringing more and more minerals into Kallax and allowing the construction of more sophisticated machines. Recycling effectively grew, until at last, Kallax was producing more than it consumed. Seeing his people prosper, Fulgrim took pride in fostering the re-emergence of art and culture, reclaiming the spirit of humanity that had been sacrificed so long ago in the struggle for survival. Terraforming technology was reinvented, allowing forests, oceans, plains, and rainforests to spread and reclaim outposts and bring life to the planet. As Kallax grew, the other settlements began to ally themselves with Fulgrim and help him rebuild and repopulate the long-abandoned cities of the planet. Using building material mined out of the reopened mines, ancient buildings were patched up and reconstructed even as towers and skyscrapers rose over the ground. Fifty standard years after Fulgrim fell from the sky, he rose to sole rulership of Camos. His beautiful forests were planted on ground once mined for metal and wondrous cities of glass, gold, crystal, and steel rose to new heights of glory. Fulgrim's presence drove a resurgence of craft, art, and intellectual refinement. And through dint of his intellect and achievements, he halted the backsliding of his hard-scrabbled world and set it upon a path, if not to greatness, then at least to a betterment of its lot. Metropolises, built over rocky plains, and forests grown on stony ground. This impulse to strive for something better would allow the people of Camos to attain something akin to great heights. And the changing of Camos into a world of art and culture inspired Fulgrim the will to grasp even more greatness. It was not long after this that the planet's isolation came to an end. From the blue skies came a flight of dropships, armored and battle-scarred, each bearing the same symbol, a two-headed eagle. On hearing of this, some fragments of memory stirred in Fulgrim. Camos had no formal army, but the dropship's landing zones had been surrounded by the caretakers, the police soldiers once responsible for maintaining order in the factory fortresses. 
Fulgrim sent word to the caretakers to stand down and allow the visitors from above into Calyx. Let's take a look at the two Primarchs Alpharius Omegon. The origin of the Primarchs Alpharius and Omegon are as mysterious as the legion they created. One story says that after the capsules were stolen and scattered by the Chaos Gods, the Primarchs Alpharius and Omegon came to rest on a nameless dead world on the edge of the Mandragoran star system, whose alien civilization had risen and was wiped out by bloody hands long before mankind first walked on Terra. On this nameless orb, the new Primarchs fell into the shattered ruins of a fallen city murdered long ages ago. Utterly alone, voiceless, and without aid, they were forced to survive against the tumultuous elements of the desolate world and the predations of the hungry ghosts that inhabited the planet. Their solitude was only broken after many long years by a new star falling from the heavens, a corsair ship of degenerate half-human renegades and alien mercenaries intent on plundering the dead ruins for whatever worth might remain amid the shatters. Instead, they found death at the young Primarch's hands, and Alpharius and Omegon gained their weapons, their knowledge, and their vessel as their own, and with it they set out in search for he who had made them. And yet in the Codex Hydra, there are two different accounts as to the origin of Alpharius Omegon. The first is that the lost Primarch was deposited on a thriving techno-oligarchy world known as Barsaver. But before their first solar decade, the skies of the planet darkened as the nightmarish Xenos worm creatures known as the Sloth descended to feed. Capturing the young Primarch, the one being alone strong enough to resist them, the Sloth kept Alpharius as a curiosity twisting his mind with their horrors and enslaving him and tutoring him as a living weapon to sow strife and discord on their victims' worlds before they fell upon them to feast. In this version of the story, it was the Emperor himself who at last liberated Alpharius, his golden battle barge ramming into the heart of the vast stone ship of the Falzinos to break it open. The Emperor's wrath, like that of a vengeful god of legend in retribution for what had been done to his son. For long Terran years after, Alpharius remained at his father's side as the Emperor undid what had been done to him. This account also offers a contradictory version of the event, saying that Alpharius alone, unfinished in some way, had been spared, or at least some part of him had remained behind, though gravely injured when the rest of the Primarchs were scattered across the stars. There in the shadow of Terra, he grew and was nurtured by the Emperor himself his existence a jealous guarded secret even for those closest to the Emperor, lest the dark fates move against him. Upon his maturity, he became the Emperor's own secret hand and his greatest shield, until he was at last parted from his father, his destiny to be fulfilled. It is unknown which one of these accounts is true or which is a lie, because even with these three origin story, there is yet another one that is most common in the Imperium. This account of the finding of Alpharius circulated secretly between the houses and factions of the ancient imperial court on Terra states that his discovery was an accident of the Luna Wolf's Legion prior to the end of the Great Crusade and the beginning of the 41st millennium. According to this tale, Alpharius was the leader of a confederation of human star systems whose fleet of warships, no match in size or scale to the imperial vessels, managed through trickery and ambush to ingloriously lay low one of the outlying Luna Wolf's battleships as it entered an unnamed star system. Responding to this unforgivable defeat, Horus himself and his fleet gave chase, only to find themselves mirrored in ambush after ambush, tricked into deadly traps, chasing shadows, until Horus' own flagship, the Vengeful Spirit, came under attack. In the ensuing confrontation, the Luna Wolf smashed the enemy's fleet's desperate attack aside, but in the confusion, a single assassin broke into the flagship, and through stealth and murder, managed the impossible task of fighting his way clear to Horus's command chamber, where he slaughtered the Primarch's Chesterian bodyguards before Horus himself was forced to confront the intruder. Horus did not slay the attacker, but instead recognized him as a brother. He had found the twentieth and last Primarch. The new arrival called himself Alpharius claimed to have been traveling the region of space for many Terran years. However, he remained tightly lipped as to where he was from. Various worlds in the local area were subsequently broken into the Imperial Fold, but Alpharius always denied that any of them were his homeworld of origin. Eventually, the conglomeration of planets he had been leading 
were persuaded to join the Imperium with little bloodshed. All of these origin stories could be wrong, but at the same time, they could all also be right, because there are two. These twin Primarchs could have been everywhere and just about anywhere. And finally, let's end things with the most famous Primarch, Horus. A capsule carrying the infant Horus Lupercal came to rest on the mining world of Sithonia. The world of Zonia existed in one of Terra's closest neighboring star systems, being within reach of even non-warp capable starcraft. Zonia had been colonized, built upon, tunneled, and mined probably since the dawn of human interstellar space travel, before even the dark age of technology had begun. As such, all of the world's natural resources had been stripped away and used millennia before, and the planet's ancient mining technology had long since been rediscovered and removed by the tech priests of Mars. The planet that remained was largely redundant and abandoned, completely riddled with catacombs, crumbling industrial plants, and exhausted mine works. None now know who were the masters of this hell world before it was rediscovered by the Imperial forces during the Great Crusade. Some Imperial scholars speculate that it was the priesthood of Mars, ever greedy for raw materials to feed their forged cities. Other sources indicate that it was a star kingdom that dwindled to nothing long before unity was even a dream on Terra. No matter who had once controlled the world, they ate the heart of Zonia until it was a dead husk. Afterwards, before even the coming of the Age of Strife, Sithonia had become an orphan world, abandoned to entropy and violence. Even before the Great Collapse, true darkness had descended there. Faced with complete and total economic and social collapse, the people of Sithonia had either left if they possessed wealth enough to return to Terra, or had sunk ever deeper into a terrible poverty defined by both its savagery and a desperate struggle for survival. Fierce, lawless gangs inhabited the depths of Sithonia, enjoying freedom from the rigors of imperial citizenship. There was no law but the blade, no desire except that to survive. Some gangs were territorial, their leaders possessing all the pretensions of barbarian kings, with armies of men and women bonded to their service. They could seize access to tunnels, demand tribute from other factions, and create enclaves in the lightless heart of abandoned tunnel networks. To other gangs, blood and power was a crop to be harvested by violence and violence alone, and the dead meat enough to live on. Holding no territory and living from plunder, these gangs raided, murdered, and burned. Where they did not need food, ammunition, or supplies, they would raid simply to enhance the fear they spread or winnow out the weak and the undeserving from their own ranks. While these reaving gangs left blood and ruin at their passing, others moved like specters on the edge of sight, killing silently and for ends that few could understand. Between these factions, a fluid web of respect, tribute, and rivalry existed. Factions would form, evolve, and dissolve in a few solar months. For those that endured longer, only one thing was certain, their time would pass. And so it was for the long years of the Age of Strife, the strong killed the weak, only to be killed themselves as others rose up, again and again and again. And somehow this murderous strain of Zethonian humanity not only survived, but thrived by murder and prospered by plunder, and so Zethonia endured for long years. While the terrible conditions on Cathonia are well documented, the exact arrival of the Primarch Horus is completely unknown. Different accounts contradict each other, and some historical documents contain enormous omissions, making it almost impossible to truly understand the Primarch's formative years. One source places Horus on Cathonia as a child, growing to maturity amongst the harsh gangs that populated the post-industrial nightmare of a world, honeycombed with long extinct mines and dominated by decay. Support for his theory is found in the way the Primarch spoke the Chthonian language. It was fluent. He spoke it with a particular hard-palated edge and rough vowels of a Western Hemispheric ganger, the most common and roughest of the Chthonian feral castes. Other theories say that Horus was never raised on the planet, and his mastery of the language was done deliberately to show his legion he was as honest and low-born as any of them. 
and yet another source claims that Horus returned to Terra itself. It is said that Horus grew at the Emperor's side, learning from his father even as they took back the soul system and forged the alliance between the techno-barbarian nations of Terra and with the Mechanicus of Mars, thus creating the Imperium of Man. The truth of the origin of the Primarch will most likely never be known. After his betrayal, the Imperium did the best they could to eradicate him from Imperial history books. And I hope you guys enjoyed the origin story of the Primarchs. Maybe now you could answer the question, is it nature or nurture that turns these beings into terrible people? If you guys have suggestions for any other topics, please let me know in the comment section below. Don't forget to hit the like button. It helps out the channel. Commenting whatever you want also helps out the channel. If you want to support us, you can do that with a super thanks or support us on Patreon. The link in the description. We get more support on Patreon. Uh, YouTube is a little shady with some of its uh, super thanks. But thanks so much for watching, and we'll talk tomorrow. This is Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>